Well hello there, welcome back to the channel, hope you're safe and well. In this video I'll be reviewing the first air rifle I ever owned, my HW97 Spring Rifle. Roll the titles. This then is my user review of the HW97K. This is the first air rifle that I've ever owned, that I ever owned. Uh, I've had it for about two years and I've probably shot a few thousand pellets or more through it over that two years. And this is my main competition gun for HFT. Uh, I decided right from the off that uh, I was going to start off by buying a Springer rather than a PCP uh, because I'm used to when in my youth when I when I used to shoot in, the, in my youth I used to shoot uh, recoiling rifles so it was a no-brainer really. Um, I had two purchases in mind. Uh, I went to my local RFD and I checked out both this and its main competitor, the Air Arms TX200. So why did I buy this one? Well, the opportunity arose to buy this from uh, a member of my club the first time that I ever visited uh, the club. And it was a proven rifle, so it was a no-brainer really. So let's have a look at the specs then. The barrel length, uh, factory specs, the barrel length 30 centimeters, which is 11.8 inches. The overall rifle length is 102 centimetres, which is 40.2 inches. And um, the factory weight, uh, they specify as four grams, uh, four kilograms, sorry, which is 8.8 .8 pounds. Um, this one, as you can see, this has got an aftermarket stock on it, so it, it weighs a bit heavier. Um, this is a Gin B stock uh, that is no longer available and um, it's very nice, lovely bit of wood. I've got the original stock that the gun, gun came with. It was actually the original was a synthetic stock, a uh, thumbhole stock as you can see. And uh, looking, looking at this, there's no marks on it. I don't think that the rifle was ever used in this stock, so there you go. Um, but obviously... Uh, with an aftermarket stock and a scope on, we need to know the weight. So uh, let's stick it on the scales. Let's check what it weighs then. With the scope. Ooh. 12.6 pounds. Change that to kilos. Let's see what the difference is. You can find the little thingy bot. There we go. Which is... 5.7 kilos. Let's have a quick look at what it did through the chrono. Over 10 shots, you can see we got an average of 737.3 feet per second, which is just over 10 foot pounds. Uh, but look at that spread and standard deviation. We got a spread of 9.9 .9 feet per second and a standard deviation of 3.5. Uh, that's pretty impressive for a Springer. That stands up against most regulated PCPs. So let's move on then. So let's talk about the pros and cons then of owning a rifle like this. Well the first one, no charging. Don't need a charging cylinder, all you need is a pocket full of pellets and you can shoot all day providing you don't get too tired cocking it. Um, Say so no air cylinder to charge up so very convenient. Uh, something that's slightly different to this one uh, compared to the Air Arms TX200. If you've seen those, they have like a, a bear trap catch. Uh, with this, when you, when you cock this and uh, put the lever back, you haven't got to fiddle around with a bear trap catch to, uh, to put the, lever, the under lever back. It just goes straight back. So that's one less sort of like little niggle really. 
Uh, one of the great things of this rifle is the trigger. It's got the world famous record trigger, which um, if you go online, if you've heard anybody talk about this, they, you know, everybody raves about this uh, record trigger. Um, it is fully adjustable and um, it is very nice. It's perfect, you know, ideal for target shooting. Uh, that being said as well, uh, cannot go on a list of pros without mentioning the accuracy. Now obviously depending on your skill as a shooter, um, on a good day I can shoot this uh, as accurately as my AS400, which is if, if you've seen previous videos you know is a super accurate gun. Um, I could shoot two uh, five, you know, five or ten shot groups side by side, one, one with a 400 and one with this. Uh, and on a good day when I'm shooting this, you probably wouldn't be able to tell which was which. It is a super accurate rifle. And um, the, main, uh, the, the last point I wanted to check, re mention really is, I've, say, I've had this two years and I haven't had to touch it. The thing just works. I've not had to fiddle with anything. I've never opened the stock up, never checked inside it, uh, never had to change anything just super low maintenance you know if it's not broke don't fix it uh, the, the thing just just works shot after shot after shot it's just an ultra reliable rifle so let's move on to the cons then because obviously nothing's perfect the first thing that I want to mention when I first started shooting this rifle I couldn't keep the uh, couldn't keep it in zero and my point of aim kept changing uh, and what I realised is the, the culprit was the stock bolts. Um, this is incredible, incredibly sensitive to these bolts being loose. As soon as these bolts loosen off, everything goes to pot. So um, doing some searching, and um, we're up, the company that makes this, actually specify torque settings uh, for these bolts. So the front... Uh, the front stock bolts need to be torqued to 2.5 newton meters, which is 22.1 inch pounds, and the one on the back, underneath, uh, that should be torqued to 5 newton meters, which is 44.3 inch pounds. Now, if you've got a torque driver and you've ever set it to 5 newton meters, you realise that that is hell of a lot of torque, um, and I found that. It's the front ones are the ones that you have to be that worried about more than this rear one. So I tend not to talk this up to five newton meters because I, I don't want to crush the wood in the stock screwing that up. So I do a little bit less on that. But certainly at the front, I stick to uh, the 2.5 and my bolts are in these sort of like brass cups so that it's not going to Squat, you know, squash the wood of the stock too much and deform the front of the stock. So if you're going to talk them up, make sure you get sort of some washers or cups in there that help protect your wood because that's quite a lot of talk to put on those bolts. So that's the first one. Then the second one is the bluing. I mean, this is a third hand rifle. You could, probably doesn't pick it up, can't pick it up on the, um, on the video. Um, but there are like little worn bits all on the edges and in certain places where the bluing has worn away. Um, it's not corrosion as such because you, you run your finger over it or your nail over it and there's no pitting or anything. It's just the bluing has just sort of worn away in places, especially around, around the, uh, uh, the front end of the barrel um, and uh, on the side of the underlever and everything. So um, I, I don't think it uh, I don't think it sort of diminishes the, the look of the rifle, but some people are a little bit fussy like that, so I thought it was worth mentioning that. Uh, reloading. Okay, <laughs> this underlever to, to load it, I won't take it all the way back, but it, even, even right on the very end where, where you're getting the, the most leverage, it does take a fair bit of effort to uh, load. So after you've been shooting it for a while, you know, the old elbow and the old arm can get going a little bit on that, can start to 
you know wear you down a bit especially when you get <laughs> especially when you get later on later on in in, uh, in years so uh, and the 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 thing about that is that I find when I'm lying down at a peg that I just find it really uncomfortable and difficult to uh, reload this lying down so I find I have to get back up onto my knees between shots to reload so you're up and down up and down a lot so um, definitely a con I think um, but it is good exercise uh, you'll see later in this video me grunting and groaning having to get up and down all the time while I'm shooting it and the final thing which is a little bugbear as well especially when you're target shooting is this safety catch it's an automatic safety so as soon as you cock the rifle, the safety catch comes on. Um, so you have to remember, when you're lying down to shoot, once you're pointing down range, first thing to do is to take the safety off. Um, once the safety's off, you can't reset it. So some people don't like that, the fact that you can't reset the safety. Um, but I just find when target shooting, I mean, certainly in HFT, most of the PCPs that people use, um, they don't have automatic safeties and some of them don't have safety catches on at all and um, you'll get into a shot and you know you'll be lined up and you haven't taken the safety off and you've got your breathing right and your reticles in position you put your finger on the trigger as soon as you put your finger on the trigger and start moving the trigger you can feel that the safety's on you know it's on and you have to take the safety off and start the process all over again so that can be a little bit annoying you have to get in a routine in your head with, you know, with one of these. As soon as you lie down and you're pointing down range, take the safety off before you start your, uh, your line-up routine or whatever routine you, do, you, you use for taking the shot. So, that's the pros and cons then. What we're going to do now is we're going to take it out on the range. Uh, I'm going to shoot it at, uh, at, on the plinking range. And uh, also, we're going to take it in the woods and shoot some HFT targets. So, off to the range. So we're at the, here at the club range then. Going to start off with a five shot group at 25 yards. Uh, see how she does. Oh. There we get on. I always get a good workout when I shoot this rifle because I find that I can't I can't cock the underlever when I'm lying down so I have to sort of keep getting up and down it's like doing squat thrusts so the more you shoot the more exercise you get put a splatter burst target for a change down there. I know some people like these splatter burst targets in videos, so uh, I'll oblige. Oh, that's two. You'll notice that with my springer, I shoot up the peg on all my shots, like a real rifle, up in the shoulder, nothing touching the ground. And this rifle, as I may have mentioned, is a bit hold sensitive. So what I tend to do is get my elbow in the ground and I push my, the back of my hand forward onto the peg. So I'm creating a triangle and then just sit in the rifle in the, in the cup of my hand. So I'm not really gripping the, the front of the stock at all, really. Three. I found that this rifle is a bit 
hold sensitive so it doesn't like the front end being gripped but you make sure that the the rifles far enough forward so you're just behind the balance point so perhaps it's a little bit barrel heavy it seems to work better That's four, I think. One more. There we go, five shots. Let's have a look at that. Oh, that's not a bad group. They're all touching. I suppose some people would call that pellet on pellet. I wouldn't. Pellet on pellet is where there's one hole and you only see one hole and it's the same size as a pellet and every other, others have gone through it in my book. Uh, they're all touching, I'll take that. Right, what we do now is uh, we'll move out to 45 yards our uh, maximum UK HFT distance and see how we get on with that. I'm going to have to move pegs because uh, I can't see the full... Can I see the 45 target from here? I might be able to. Oh yeah, forget the last one, I can stay here because I can, I can see the 45 from here. Okay, well just change the target. Right. Right, I'm going to shoot this uh, with my HFT setting, so I'm not changing my parallax. So, in this scope, 45 yards is just slightly out of focus, but uh, not terribly. And my aim point should be one and a half mil dots. So we see how we get on. First one. There's a slight breeze blowing from left to right, but I'm not aiming off for for it. I'm just sort of aiming at the centre of the target. Oh, that one dropped a bit low. <coughs> that must be me. Oh. Uh. I must admit, it is the longer targets that I tend to struggle with on a course. And the shorter ones. It's got where the other one's gone. So that's three. Hopefully they'll all end up 
within the 35 millimeter group. We can but we can but hope. Yeah, they are heading off a little bit to the right. One more. Well, there we go. They're all there, all but thereabouts. I think that last one hit the ball. So, let's go and have a look, shall we? Right, this is a 25 yard target then. Let's get the ruler on this one. We'll do the center to center. And you can see the center to center is about seven or eight mils. Move around this side. Yeah, seven to eight millimeters, seven, seven, center to center. So they'd all fit nicely into a 15 millimeter kill. So I'm happy with that. So let's have a look at the 45, which is not so good. Move that out of the way. So this is a target of 45 yards then. You can see this one. Here is my bit of a flyer. Let's put the ruler on here and see what we're what we're doing here. So that's 19 mil center to center, and we get that one over there. That's 19 mil center to center as well. Uh, how far out does it go if we come up to this one? Oh, that's not too bad. That's 25 mil. 25 mil center to center. Yeah. So, what did I say on the first one? 20 mil. So, if we ignore that, we've got a 20 mil group center to center there, these four shots. If we add that one, then it, it brings that out to 25 mil. But at the end of the day, we've got 35 mils to play with which is to this point here. So you can see they're all going to go in there every day of the week. Right around this, this bit as well. 35, yeah, they're all inside 35. So they'd knock the target over. So that's the shooting on the range then. Not my best effort at 45 yards, but it's okay. While we're down the club, Seems silly not to shoot some uh, targets in the woods. So we had a shoot on Sunday. This is a couple of days later. So the, the, uh, the targets are still out. The course hasn't been reset. So we might as well have a go shooting them. This is peg two. It's a uh, 35 millimeter crow up in a tree. And uh, I reckon it's about 35 yards. So that's what I'm going to shoot it at anyway. We'll see how we get on. A little bit of a breeze, but I'm going to ignore that for the moment. There we go. Killed it. Don't forget to pull your targets up when you've knocked them over. Right, find another peg and move along. Right, we've just moved along one peg then to the next peg. And this is a rabbit. Looks like a 15 millimeter kill. Probably about, it's quite close. So for me, this is always gonna be a, a 
crosshair shot so the range not too important but I reckon it's probably about 20 yards so not too far the kill's in the head and it's been it's been well shot up There we go, that one's down as well. <laughs> right, this is peg eight, right by this tree here. So obviously this is a supported shot. You've got a kneel or stand board, so you can either take this supported standing or supported kneeling. So let's try it supported standing first, and then, uh, and then we'll give it a go kneeling. I haven't got a kneeling cushion with me, but we'll see if I can do it without crippling myself. She goes. Right, let's adjust the camera. Let's see if we can do it kneeling. First kneeler then, knee closest to the, the peg goes down, and then you can put your, you can put your elbow on your trailing leg, makes it a lot more stable, and sit on your heel of your other foot. There we go, goes down, with a bit of luck. Alright, we moved up to peg 14 then. I mentioned earlier that I tend to struggle with the longer ones, so I thought, oh, I'll practice the ones that you struggle with. So I picked the, probably, the furthest target in the wood, which is probably nearly full distance. It's out quite high up a tree. It's a 35 millimeter kill. Looks like a, a lion or a tiger or something. I don't know what that's, whoa. A leopard would be up a tree, I suppose. Could be a leopard. So we'll, we'll give that a go, see how we get on with that. If it's 45 for me, yeah, it's going to be quite a little bit out of focus. Gives me an indication of the, the distance. I'm bothered by flies. So we'll shoot it at 45 and see how we get on. Told you I wasn't any good at these ones. We'll give it another go. Can't knock them all down first time, can we? Oh, what I need to remember is what I was doing out on the range, what I was aiming, and the pellets were dropping a little bit low, so I think I need to give it a little bit more elevation than I, than I did last time. So we'll try that. See where the kill is. Yeah. There we go. Give it a bit more elevation with the knowledge that I should have used with the first shot and it went over. There's lots of information all the way through the course. You just gotta spot it and use it. it. Makes life a lot easier. Okay, so that's the 97 in the woods then. Not bad, eh? Let's talk about prices then. Now, when I did the last review, the review of my AR Arms S400, um, I thought, oh, I'll try something I haven't seen anybody do before. And I went uh, online and showed you um, uh, websites for gun dealers. Well, since then I've discovered that, that that's against YouTube's terms of service, which is why nobody else was doing it. So uh, I was, I'm lucky not to get, get that video taken down. So we won't do that again. 
So uh, you'll have to take my word for it that I've done a search to come up with the prices. Now looking for a new one, um, obviously these are available in different stock options. You can get them in uh, a beach stock, you can get them in laminated stock and you can get synthetic stock. They're all slightly different prices um, with the, um, the synthetic stock being the cheapest. Um, the cheapest that I could find online at the moment at the time of making this video, brand new from a dealer, was £456. And the cheapest uh, wooden beach stock uh, variant I could find was £475. Now when you bear in mind that if you're looking, comparing this against this main competitor which is the Air Arms TX200, a brand new TX200 is uh, a pound under £700. So basically you're paying, you know, it's over £200 more uh, to buy a TX200. Now, uh, I've not done a great deal of shooting with a TX200, I've shot one a few times, but um, I can't see that it's £200 worth of better, if you know what I mean. So uh, moving on to the second hand market then, I went on um, all the well-known um, sites that most people go on to search to see what's available, and um, the best second hand uh, 177 um, HW97 in a beach stock that I could find was priced at £295 uh, but on the whole they generally go second hand for around £300 to £350 so you're going to save just over £100 from a new one buying one second hand um, looking at the second hand market for the TX200 you're probably going to be paying about £100 more um, for a second hand TX200 than a second hand Weirock. So with current prices then, and for the, what you're getting for your money, um, this is a serious contender and something that you need, need to be worth considering if you're looking to buy a, uh, a Springer for uh, HFT or target shooting or shooting in general really. It's, a, it's an excellent rifle. If you learn how to tame it, it's one of the most accurate guns you'll ever shoot. So there it is then. Sorry this video got a little bit long, but um, there was a lot of stuff to say, uh, to say and uh, a lot of things that I wanted to include. So um, I hope you've uh, enjoyed uh, watching it and you found it interesting. And uh, I won't keep you any longer, but... Uh, Thanks for your continued support of the channel, really appreciate it, and uh, I will see you on the next one.